You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. Luther said, uh, marriage is a training ground for spirituality. Welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for youth and their adults too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter and Marriage. I'm your co-host, Erica Sorensen, along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Hi, Pastor Harrison Goodman. Hi. Pastor Goodman, we have two guests today. I'm excited, I'm really excited. to talk to. Would These you are introduce fun people. them? So I, I have uh, I have Pastor Chris Hull and and his wife Allison with us here today. Uh, we're going to be tackling we're going to be tackling marriage, right? They are also tackling marriage. I tackle marriage every day. It's awesome. <laughs> they call me the JJ Watt of marriage. I tackle it so much. There you go. Cut. That's a wrap. We got. Let's it. just let's just keep that awkward <laughs> pause in there. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, it's it's hard to sort of do a, a marriage podcast aimed at people who are not married. Um, but I think it's sort of a, a valuable thing because it, it's not only something that uh, a, a lot of our kids are going to be staring at down the line, but it also speaks very deeply to a, a faith that is is, uh, is is wrapped up inside of marriage too, in that it, it uses uh, marriage as an image for uh, the way that we would relate to our God. So in all of these things, um, I, I think uh, it, it's it's a it's a worthwhile topic simply because well, it, it roots us in our bodies, right? Mm-hmm. And our tagline for this uh, podcast is "Faith in the F- in the flesh for this disembodied age." Uh, and we know that today everyone, not just youth, is more con- disconnected than ever. And I mean, we can blame our smartphones and screens and all the things, but the fact of the matter is, it just is. Um, and so we're talking about things that are uh, that 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 matter to the body. Um, and this is a really, really great one, as Pastor Goodman mentioned. Um, marriage certainly uh, uh, paints a picture of our of our union with Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. uh, even if we don't end up being married, because we do want to talk, we're talking to kids, right? We're talking to youth. So we do want to talk about marriage in a way that we were assuming, obviously, they're not married, but they are thinking, I think, along the line someday of, are they going to be married? And what does marriage look like? Um, so let's, should we dive right in? How's that sound? Yeah. All right. So um, as I mentioned, the we're talking about the, the one flesh union of marriage. How does that one flesh union of marriage sort of echo our union with Christ? And, and then I'm going to ask you the follow-up question is, how is society sort of getting this wrong? How is, it, how is society being unhelpful? But let's talk, talk about first, about that one flesh union. You want to get us off, my love, or no? You have notes. Like, she does notes and all these things. I mean, that's marriage for you, isn't it? One doesn't do any of that, and the other one does all of it. So it's, And then he looks <laughs> off my paper. And I look over paper. Yeah, he really cheats bad. off your paper. I'm going to pretend that's what, uh, you know, I said. So Hey, it's one but, uh, flesh. There's no ownership there. Yeah, it's every, it, yeah. it's uh, what's mine is yours. Yours is it's, it's fantastic, you know? No, but you yeah. get one flesh from in Genesis, right? Well, yeah. So Genesis mm-hmm. 2, verse 18, they <clears> say, <throat> it's not good for man to be alone. We're going to make a help meet. For him, help right? me from and you looked it up this this word easer easer is help a. it's is the help easer is 21 times in the old testament that it talks okay. about help and it's usually like in hosea 13 9 lord is my help right lord mm-hmm. is my easer. and so you looked up well you what? get like from samuel first samuel right israelites win raises up the stone of help the ebenezer so mm. when you look at this one flesh union god gives the woman to the man as this helper and a uh, helper. It's not this um, like submissive slave like person. This is one that's literally there. I, I need help to get through life. And mm-hmm. this is prior to the fall. Even 
I mean, this isn't like post fall. God says, oh, you know, now he's really in trouble. Let's give him a help. This is prior to the fall. God says, it's not good that man's alone. I'm going to give him a helper. There's nothing in all creation to match this. So he Mm -hmm. brings the woman to him, this beautiful image of Christ in the church. Well, to him, from him. From him, right. Right. So, mm-hmm. and so, and that is Christ and his church and it's this one flesh. So in Genesis two twenty three, it talks about the one flesh and how you will leave your mother and father and cling to each other. Right. You'll hold mm-hmm. fast to each other. Yeah. This is the relationship that matters. Same with Christ and the church. That's the relationship that matters. Christ is thinking only of his bride, the church, the church thinking only of her bridegroom, Christ, all the time. Mm -hmm. How often does the church go astray when she thinks of the world, when Mm -hmm. she thinks of um, the matters of mammon and things like that? Thinks Thinks of herself. Yeah. Right. Or herself. Mm -hmm. Now, Christ never thinks of himself. It's always, Mm -hmm. I go to lay down my life for the sheep. I go down to lay my life down for those that the Father has sent me to save. So Christ is always thinking. His entire existence is for the church and the church's entire existence is for Christ. And how does the world, how does society get that wrong is rather than being sacrificial, the world is a more selfish place. What brings you joy? And if it doesn't bring you joy, you get rid of it, right? Yeah. Like, is that terrible woman that says to do that? <laughs> get rid of things that don't bring you joy. Yeah. So I can say if your books don't bring, my books bring me great joy. Stop telling me to get rid of my books. <laughs> No one likes you. And okay, I'm we're like, not promoting hoarding, to be clear. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, but, but I think this is actually sort of worth yeah. tackling, right? In a world that, that's going to sort of view marriage as a, a pain, as a burden instead of a gift. Um, can, can you actually point to this and say, this is something that maybe you shouldn't delay indefinitely as, as a kid? Is this something that uh, you shouldn't sort of have to work your way up to um, so that you're, you're ready to finally tackle it? Is marriage a good thing or a bad thing and, and why? Mm-hmm. I know um, this past summer at the conference in um, Carbondale, I, I encouraged the kids. I said, don't wait to get married till you're a lot older. Like, okay, I have everything in life set. Now I can get married. Marriage isn't this thing that you got to be like, okay, I got to make sure I'm ready to go. Then I can do it. Mm-hmm. This is what's going to help you through these things. Mm-hmm. Um, through college, even through life decisions about job, about where you're going to live, all these different things. God will give you in his time, that man or that woman to bear the cross with you, to actually go through the hard times, to go through the joyful times, to, to bear it all together. Marriage isn't just something, like you said, Brother Goodman, it's not like, okay, now I've, I've hit it all, do this. This is something that if God has given me that person that desires to go through life with me, why delay it? Why put mm-hmm. it on? There's, there's no point to that. It's, it's too joyful to put off. It's so you keep using, you keep using these two words though, joy and sacrifice together in a way that I think that that's worth sort of exploring because most of the time when I'm thinking about sacrifice, I'm not thinking about joy. And when I'm thinking about joy, I'm, I'm not thinking about sacrifice. Um, how, how do these things connect to you that, that you can speak this way? When you look at loving others, think what gives Jesus the most joy is going to the cross. Like even like Passion of the Christ, you see him hugging the cross. It's like, this is the most joyful thing I can think of doing right. is going to die for the sins of the world. When I'm in my marriage or as a dad, the most joyful thing is what can I be doing for them? What can I do to give them a joyful day? What can I do to give them a better day, a, a, a safer day? All these things, this is what gives me joy is living sacrificially for that other, living for my wife. What can I be doing? sacrificing time, talent, treasure, whatever it is for that person. Cause that's my greatest joy. It's reverse, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, it takes Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We have new hearts, new desires, new things that make us happy. Um, mm-hmm. Before I got married, did watching Hallmark movies make me happy? No. Well, maybe. They kind of did. I, she was the one that started watching Hallmark because of me. Um, but, that, that's a good podcast. but the thing is, it's like you just, it, it changes. And it's not because this person has made you into a different person. This person has made you into who you were created to be mm-hmm. in Christ. They help you do that. Um, Allison, 
Uh, I happen to know that Pastor Hull calls you something specific. He has a nickname for you. I'm going to ask you to tell us what that is. And then I want you to, um, can you can you talk about, um, Pastor Hull's talked about the kind of the role of husband and what he, how he ties it back to Christ and the church. Can you then talk about how, what what the role of wife is and how that sort of relates to your nickname potentially? If you can tie those things together, kind of throwing that one at you, but I think you can do it. Yeah, he calls me my rib. And, you know, it's obviously from Genesis when the Lord makes woman out of Adam's rib. Um, and so uh, it's it's not a uh, lower thing. It's a, it's a thing of um, that we are one flesh together. And the rib also has a specific purpose. The rib is supposed to protect, right? It protects valuable organs in the body. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's its purpose and its job. And like, as a help me, as a, as a wife that helps your, her husband, you're there mm -hmm. to protect and to help him. It, I, I don't know. I was looking up in, in Ecclesiastes, it says that like two are better than one. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be together so that if one falls, the other lifts them up. And it says, it's not good for you to be alone because what if you fall? No one's there to lift you up. <laughs> and yeah. so that's I fall a lot. I fall a lot. <laughs> like mm -hmm. one of the joys of being married is like when I don't feel like like when I feel like sleeping in, my husband's mm -hmm. like, No, you better go to church, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And that never right. happens because she's a perfect saint who never sends. So she always wants to go to church. But I'm usually mm -hmm. over. So it's always fun. But yeah. we're there to lift each other and to yeah. help. It's a lot of so this, this might actually be a place to kind of interject though. Um, Go because I, I mean, there's that stare, there's that the, every sitcom sort of has the, the typical marriage of, of sort of the husband is the dumb burden. The, the wife is overworked and tasked and, and you know, the, the people are joyful in and of themselves and only because they're joyful in and of, of themselves, does it ever sort of work together? Because like you, you could tell that, you know, the person, the guy would be happier without her. She would be happier without him, but they just love each other anyway. Um, how do we actually talk about this in, in a way that it doesn't sort of leave us like wrapped up in our, not just sort of our own wants and desires, like our old Adam, but just sort of this, this idealized, you know, spiritual connection that, that everybody sort of envisions out there because of, well, because of your Hallmark movies, Hall. I love them. <laughs> hey, don't bash them. It's the same movie every time. So I'm never anxious. Um, no, we, we were talking about that. Like if you could find a relationship on TV, you know, uh, between husband and wife, what would it be? And we, we couldn't really come up with anything except for maybe in How I Met Your Mother with Marshall and Lily. And they make fun of that relationship every single episode mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're always talking to one another. They're always trusting each other. They're always together in a sense that like they don't they don't keep secrets. They don't lie. They, there's nothing bad towards them. They have that strong relationship with each other and they're made fun of constantly for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. and it's like when I mentioned earlier, it's like the um, bringing, making trouble, making a problem. It's you, when you envision that it's almost like the sitcom, like the, the Tim Allen breaking the the house down or Homer Simpson or something, but not it, filling, like not replacing the toilet paper roll. Yeah. Something like that. But <laughs> that it's, is um, really annoying. That's a, that's a, that it is. It's the worst for the kids because they're the ones that have to reach through the door, eyes closed. Like, yeah. let's be fair. The people who really suffer whenever that happens are always the kids. <laughs> <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. like, um, every pastor has to fill out this thing called a set form. And I don't know what mm -hmm. set stands for. I can't remember. I think it's just like set questions, but it's like a bunch of doctrinal questions, but they ask this one really silly question. They say, what's your greatest strength in the ministry? And, and most pastors will say like, Oh, it's my, my knowledge of the book of Concord, or I can trace my lineage of pastor all the way back to Luther himself or the Holy spirit, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Sorry, I just called the Holy Spirit something like that. Um, but to give some <laughs> people something to talk about, I put on in that one section, I just put my wife, just those two words, my wife. And everyone goes, well, what, what do you mean by that? Does that mean? And I said, well, it means that the vocation I have as a pastor is a vocation that really ticks the devil off. And it, it infuriates him. And it does so much damage to his kingdom that every single day when I go out to do this work, I infuriate him and a, a whole legion of demons. And the world is infuriated. 
I bring that home with me. Not meaning I bring it home like, ah, but meaning when I come home, all that stuff comes with me. Hmm. So there's one person that God has gifted me in my life that will be with me for better or worse, for richer or poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. And that's my wife. That's my Allison. And the reality is she then faces that with me. But the thing is, she it's even harder for her because she hasn't been placed into an office to bear that. Mm-hmm. She hasn't been placed into the ministry to bear that. She didn't like get into marriage going, okay, I'm ready for this. She got into marriage knowing I want to live for this man to bear the cross with him. So, so if I didn't have that, I would not be able to do these things. So how she takes the troubles I have, it's like the day I had to watch a four-year-old die from cancer. Yeah. You bring that back home. You're not going to walk in the house and go, hey, honey, or hmm. the day you, or, or vice versa. You come home and it's just joyful, but she's had a terrible day. All these so, things, that's, that's the strength there. You're talking about a, a very physical, a tangible, a, an embodied strength to a, a mental and f- a spiritual problem. Like you, you're talking about like the demons that we cannot see and and we want to go to war with somehow with like our prayers or whatever. Um, yeah. But you have you have a very concrete, like a, a, an embodied help in, in those things. Um, talk more about that. When you look at the reality of the demonic, the reality of the spiritual realm, you pray you do these things and but it's still it, it deals with the body it stresses the body out it stresses the mind out and mm-hmm. there can be some very unhealthy ways of handling that you can just uh despair you can be anxious you can be depressed you can uh, drink yourself to death you could eat yourself to all these different things and god instead says you know what all that stuff is just going to be inviting more in inviting more problem in I'm going to give you this person instead that's going to look at you and say, hey, even if you did mess up today, Jesus still loves you. Luther said uh, marriage is a training ground for spirituality in which we daily have a gift of forgiving each other. So what is your wife is one keeps you humble because I mentioned the bad stuff of what happens on that day when I delivered a, a rock star sermon and everyone's like, oh, I wish I could hear that sermon again. Your wife goes, it was okay. You did a good job. You know, you use your pastor voice a little too much. And it's like, boom, it's perfect. You know, you you need that. So it's not only bearing the cross with you, but it's also bringing you down and say, hey, you're not the guy who died on the cross either. Yeah. You're the guy who has died for on the cross. And uh, that's- it's, yeah, exactly. The forgiveness is a big part of marriage. When a, a really good friend of uh, my husband's and mine said, um, and I don't, I, I don't know the exact quote, so I'm going to paraphrase it, but you marry the person that you are willing to forgive the most. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that is the person that you are going to just, that's your basic, that's basically your job is to forgive them over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and that is, that's kind of a really kind of mind blowing way to sort of think about it because I can certainly say when I was, uh, you know, I don't know, 19, 20, 21, thinking about like, oh, who am I going to marry someday? I wasn't like, ooh, who am I going to forgive all the time? Who do I really want to forgive all the time? Um, But I like that. Can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about forgiveness in marriage? I'm going to send it off to Allison too. Um, And and how that is sort of this, the strength of a Christian marriage um, that maybe can impact society, maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe be a, maybe be a beacon of light a little bit. Yeah. Well, because society tells you, why do you have to marry, really? You know, like you can live together for a couple of years, test it out, see if you really like it. And then maybe for the tax benefits, you can get married or, you know, like maybe for something else or maybe you've worn him down enough that, you know, he'll finally marry you or something like that. Mm-hmm. But really. <laughs> that didn't happen with me. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, we know. I was playing t-ball and now I'm in the World Series. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. High five, 16 year old Chris. So Boom. Not- <laughs> Sorry. So I get excited sometimes about it. So you're not Good. looking at marriage in the best light to begin with. And then yeah. when things don't work out very well, when there's fights, when there's arguments, when life happens, when I don't know, <laughs> when, when you don't refill the toilet paper or. <laughs> Come, did I leave it like this morning or something? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to think back to this morning. I'm like, when I left the toilet paper, 
you have a bunch of sons too that could have done it. They could have, they, could have, they could have made a house out of it for all I know. We're gonna, yeah. uh, can we actually take a break? We're going to settle this toilet paper. Or something. Yeah. Uh, no, I want to watch it happen. Let's go. Oh, this is gonna, it'll be part of the podcast if there's going to be an argument. We're yeah. going to re- keep recording. Sermon. <laughs> this hard thing brought to you by needs. Redeemer Luther Church in so and so Missouri. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Oh, okay. okay, but no, like let's let's push on it a little bit though, especially yeah. just recognize like how many marriages break um to the yeah. point that that they are not just sort of two people struggling through but but end in divorce are broken beyond the point where where somebody can see it as repairable. Um if I can't imagine a deeper hurt. I I, I can't I, I mean to to expect to be forgiven more by one person than anyone else, um, to to be able to be sacrificed for and, and then to to be without that. I, I can see sort of the idea um of sort of a disembodied connection to another person because it won't hurt as bad. Um how do you mm-hmm. how do you imagine being that vulnerable in front of somebody? You wanna answer that? You want me to? You want well, to it has to be a mutual thing of I'm going to be open and honest with you and I'm not going to, to not tell you the truth or to kind of sweep things away and, and not tell you what I'm struggling with. Because mm. the minute that you don't talk about your struggles or things that are going on with you is the minute that you're inviting the devil into that relationship. And resentment and accusation. Yeah. You kind yeah. of build that wedge between you two. And so you have to be as honest and as open as you can be. And and the world doesn't like that, right? The world doesn't want you to be open and honest um, with another person because then that means that uh, you're strengthening that relationship because then that person is going to be honest with you and talk about their struggles and their things that are going on with them. Um, and then that's that's the way that you're sharpening iron together is, is you guys are saying, okay, this is what I'm struggling with. And then you can say, but God is is the one that we need to talk to the most about this. And mm-hmm. so let's bring him yeah. into this marriage and keep it. Well, he's already there. I mean, that's he's the fun part. Um, well, and, and like you, you mentioned, getting hurt. Anything worth doing is, uh, that's worth doing well is going to get hurt, you know? Um, How do you build muscle? Well, yeah, you build muscle you by getting hurt. Good food mm-hmm. is a risk, you know, tasty food. I mean, anything that's worth doing well is worth getting hurt. You know, sorry, I always go to food. Oh, I'm just um, thinking what food is going to hurt you. <laughs> you never know. I know if you ever fry food, you get spattered a lot. That can be yeah, quite I painful. Do. I, 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 I followed you there, Hull, on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was right, I was right, right there anything, with you. Anything that's good, it, it's like, yeah, like having fun, even. Like just having fun. I'm not going to have fun just sitting down on my couch. Maybe now if, if you maybe if you notice about me, I'm a little bit of an extroverted type person. Um, I like having fun by going out and, and talking to people. Other people are more introverted and rather sit on a couch and have fun. But I mean, that's, <laughs> no, I'm really gonna, I tell you, that's why we get along so well. Um, but you, you get out, and you just do something you 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 risk and marriage is risky. It, yeah. It's a risk. And why it's a risk is I remember back in college, I hated my roommate by the end of the year. Um, why? Because you spend just a little bit of time with them. You're kind of just tired of each other. Marriage, you're you're not just with them, but you're sharing money with them. You're sharing everything with them. You're sharing a and bathroom. Sharing a bathroom, you know. <laughs> obviously, yeah, back to the toilet, the toilet paper. paper incident. Yeah. Um, so so, like, quilted, and that's where it's ours. She said, Charmin, I would have gone quilted northern. But <laughs> that's the thing is it, it's so risky, but it's a risk that Jesus has already seen every scenario for you. Jesus went to the cross with every risk and every failure. So as you enter into that risky life, that cross-bearing life, you go mm-hmm. knowing you're following Christ in his train. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the joy of it. That's what gives it uh, a, a joyful riskiness. I, think joyful, that was I the, like that. Yeah, I think that was the answer to the next question I had too. You, you talked about marriage as a risk, um, but marriage is given as an image of Christ in the church. So how is it? how is it a risk then? in that mm-hmm. connection too, as we Christians then stand before the bridegroom. Well, it's, it's risky also because even though you're married in Christ, you still have this sinful flesh that clings to you. You still mm-hmm. got like, what does it mean to forgive? Right. It comes from the, uh, some Greek word, uh, which kind of leads to let go, you know, and you let go of something, you forget it. But what mm-hmm. happens in so many arguments, if you've had arguments, which we're, we're one of those marriages that's never argued. Don't we never have. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> How many years of bliss? 17 years thus far. Nope. 
Now yeah, Allison's going to have to forgive you for lying. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is with it, every <laughs> argument then goes, okay, let me go back into the, the, the safe vault, here. The let me go to the vault. Yeah. Oh, I remember when yeah. you did this back in 2010. Mm -hmm. or I remember when you did this. And that's the thing is in Christ, that doesn't exist. So there's always the struggle. So what's the key things to do in marriage is as you recognize the risk, as you recognize that old Adam swimming back up again, go, well, let's drown him again. I'm going to drown yeah. yours. You drown mine. Boom. So that we can have, and it's not safe because marriage is also never safe. The moment you say, I will not, I do, but I will. The devil goes challenge accepted. Yeah. You know, I'm coming mm -hmm. at you with the world and all my forces. But guess what? We got Jesus. <laughs> um, what did uh, Gerhard say? And uh, I said 724 should be a wedding hymn. It's called If God Himself Before Me. Sing mm -hmm. that at your wedding. It's just like, guess what? God's for you. Everything's going to come at you, but He's got you. Mm -hmm. So it's only in Christ you have that, but you have to recognize the risks outside of Him so that you rely more and more on Him every day of the marriage. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, because I remember just tying back to Allison, you talked about being vulnerable and, and sharing everything and trusting everything. Um, and it's really, marriage is all about, and it's a very difficult task. It's a difficult undertaking. It's also something we, we are supposed to, that we do with, with our Lord as well. But, um, we a lot of times focus on marriage as being that one flesh union. There's obviously we're talking about sex and procreation, but you are specifically talking about being emotionally naked, right? Before one another. And that's really difficult too. And in, and we talked about the forgiveness piece of it, because I think that's the risk that, that you were talking about is if I become completely vulnerable before, before this person, they could reject me. They could not forgive me. Um, and um, again, the neat thing about that, I think, is that points to our union with Jesus and baptism, because there are some people who will not be married in this life and will not experience that. But how can they still receive those gifts? Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> like what? I mean, that, that, that gift of that union with Jesus, you alluded to. I mean, you talked about it a little bit. But. It's there. Right? Well, take like Sunday morning. Um, we do the confession and absolution. I, and imagine if we all just said exactly what we failed at that week. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, I promised God I wasn't going to drink and I, I drank again and did not yeah. Or I promised God I wasn't going to yell at people and I did it. Or I promised God I wasn't going to look at pornography again and I did it again. Can you imagine if Sunday morning you just said all this stuff? Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd all have to run out of the church in shame. Like, oh, no. But everyone does this. It's like, okay, your, your thing may not be lust. Your thing may not be anger, but you got something. Mm -hmm. And when you have marriage, it's like, okay, I have this person that has taken this vow to say, I know, I know all of your warts and moles and everything. I know the most embarrassing stuff about you and I'm still with you. I know what you actually sleep in, like pajama wise instead of. And yeah, so that, that's, that's a different podcast. Um, I think I've said that about a couple of times. I know you, I know you sleepwalk at night or I know. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. I got I the dirt. I got the dirt, babe. I know that you, 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 you talk in your sleep and you mumble uh -huh. stuff. I know who you're mad at at church right now. Um, yeah. stuff like that, you know, yeah. Yeah. but, but that's the thing is Christ knows all this. He knows it even more than your spouse does. He yes. knows it more than your, cause when he went to the cross, it wasn't like when he was hanging there, God said, ha ha, gotcha. You didn't know this guy was going to do this. And she's like, oh, well, I'm going to get down now. That's a little too much for me. He knew all of it. He knew every single shameful, guilt-ridden thing about you. And yet still went to the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He still went and did it because he knew it. Why? Because unlike the world that wants to reveal your shame, he went to the cross that he may cover it up. That's what a good spouse does. They, they, they cover you in Christ. So when we look at Christ in the church, that's why when you have other people that aren't married, or maybe they're a widow or a widower, they don't have that. Live that for each other. Take that mm -hmm. same love that you have, that, that strength, and carry it out throughout the congregation. Good marriages will trickle down into the rest of the flock and show the love of Christ. Well, you know, like when you're in church a lot of the time and you see that somebody hasn't been in church for a long time, mm -hmm. you can actually reach out to them as a brother and sister in Christ and say, hey, 
what's going on. How you doing? Yeah. Let's, let's <clears throat> talk. Let's go have coffee. Let's, let's understand what's going on. So I think that can be a help too. Yeah. Not in like a condescending way. No. A where have you been type thing, but it's a, I love you. Actually tell people you love them. What's it going to hurt? I mean, I told you, I loved you on the third date. I mean, that was a risk. That was a risk. Risk. But it was a bold move, Cotton. But I did it. Um, I did it. Now look where we are. Ha ha. Who's <laughs> laughing now? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's a worthwhile thing to say, though. Too fast, Chris. Too early. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the one laughing. That's a worthwhile thing to say, though, and it flows out of out of those normalized vocations. There, there are different kinds of love, yes, but mm -hmm. like it, it's a good thing for friends to be able to to say that for brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to say, "I love you." Um, it's right. going to have different um, ways that it plays itself out because love is a vocational word. It, it's it's tied to an action um, and, and not a feeling. And so, yeah, to to sort of have this place where you can start to normalize this vocabulary, it, it's going to and even be able to picture it to live inside of it it's going to have connections on the way outside of it i love it right i love i love how you you both sort of tied your answer to being part of a congregation which is the body of christ right so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to pull that in um and talking about just different different ways in which we can love one another who are in the same body with us you think about maybe people who are widowed or people who have gone through a terrible divorce um or I, or, or anything, anything, and they're maybe feeling alone. Maybe they just need an I love you and a hug. You just think mm -hmm. about the power of touch and a hug, I think, is um, is wonderful. And there's so many different opportunities and ways we can minister to each other. But I, I, I thank you for tying that to the actual congregational life, um, the body of Christ, which is pretty awesome. Do we have any other any questions for them? Um, I think we kind of covered it. I think I might have one. I I, I mm. think I'm going to have it's one. It's not for about each toilet paper. I hope. No, oh, it's fine. not about toilet paper. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask each of you to um to just give advice to Pastor Hull to to men as they to young men mm. as they are thinking about marriage and what that entails, and then and then to you, Allison, as well. What would you say to women who are thinking about marriage to, to the people that are listening to this podcast that maybe they're 14, 15, 16, 17, I don't know how old, but um, what, what advice would you give them in this day and age? I mean, I look at, I look at how I was back when I was a teenager and I think about how society was telling me what to do, you know, like date as many people as possible, try to find who you're like compatible with, but it wasn't like, think about your future, think about who you would like to be married to. It was more, eh, if you like them, if they look pleasing to you, you know, then you can kind of date them and see what goes from there. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter what they believe. If they look nice and they're nice to you, you know, like you could possibly date them. And I think we have to be more discerning with what we're doing um, with ourselves. And we have to think about, uh, what God is, finds pleasing and what we would think about for the future and for marriage. And so um, if that means like narrowing our dating pool so that uh, it's somebody that will be a, uh, a helper in marriage, that will be able to um, bring Christ into when your dark times, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's a big big thing to do is like to, to talk about the Bible and to talk about um, the, the issues that you are going through right now and to see if they're compatible with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little deeper, yeah. going a little deeper. <laughs> yeah. Me yeah. or him? <laughs> no, no. I mean, you're saying go deeper than just the surface yeah. level because I think I, I would agree with you because you, you can look at um, any social media, um, and, and you can see like with all the filters and the way yeah. uh, people present themselves and sort of look at potential partners or mates, um, they're really doing themselves a disservice, which is I think what you're saying is they're doing themselves a disservice um, because uh, really their value is more than that. And then the potential children they have someday have more value than that. And so um, it, it having um, the framework of um, the way Christ died for his church and um, that as the, as the one flesh union um, thinking a little deeper about who is going to understand that with you is, 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 is the right way to go. Um, yeah. It's, it's, 
it's not impossible, but you have somebody who's, uh, who's taking care of you and watching, watching out for you. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of have to think about, you kind of have to think about yourself and who you are. Yeah. And then you have to kind of then decide, I'm going to think about the future and I'm going to think about what would help me and what would make a good relationship with me. And so you kind of have to look at what you need and then you kind of have to go from there. So you can't necessarily just look at the outside, but you have to look at yourself inside as well. Because you have value. And why, do you, why does any woman have value? Why does any Christian woman have value? Because of God. Because of Christ. Because of Christ, he died for us, and we're united with him in our baptism. So we're worth more than that. Absolutely. Pastor Hull, how about for the gentlemen out there? Don't what do you stupid. tell your sons? Or what do you tell your sons? Stop being stupid. No, I literally mean it. Stop being stupid. I mean, the thing is, you're a man marries a woman, so you got to be a man. I mean, I mean, this is the thing is, it's it's uh, have good brotherhood good brother friends, not, not the, uh, old, old ball and chain or why can't you come out type thing. I mean, a fraternity of brothers, these guys that are like, we're brothers in Christ. We, we sharpen you. We remind you who you are in Christ mm-hmm. and you have that. So as you're a teenager, I think one of the best focuses as a teenage boy is realizing one day you're going to be a man. You're growing into it right now. So have that good fraternity of good brothers that want to grow into that as well. So that when the time comes for you to have that woman that God has given you, to be with her, to be married to her, you are the man she needs you to be. So take these years to be training to be married, to be living Mm -hmm. sacrificially, to be learning the scriptures, learning the catechism, learning virtue, learning morality, learning what it means to work hard and do these things. Christ has done it for you. You do it for her. She is the most priceless thing in your life. So live it. And that's what you take these years to do. That's what I'm doing with my sons. When we look at this, it's not that on my, when my sons get married, I'm going to be like, oh, good, take them, take them. But no, it's, it's I'm training them to go be this, and I'm, we're raising our daughter to trust a man to do this. And those are two <laughs> different things. And both take prayer, both take time. So my, my advice is to young men, um, take the time now to be molded into the man you're going to be for that woman. And realize that God will bring that woman to you just as he brought Eve to Adam. And it'll happen. You don't have to go out running around looking. Um, Go to a higher things conference. Go to a higher things retreat. Talk to girls. Get to know girls. That's great. Get to know the girls that are like-minded with you and you have things in common with. But talk to them. Listen more right now. Which, as I know, is hard. She's like, oh, she's so pretty and cute. Um, So take the time. Hang out with the bros. And uh, realize one day God will give you that woman. It'll be good times. Yeah. I love it. Was that a Holes. good answer? Was yeah. That I was going to check. Was that a, no? <laughs> yes, dear. He did good, but we're still going to talk about that toilet paper roll. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's for off the air. Hulse, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Oh, this was fantastic. All right, guys, we explored faith in the flesh for this disembodied age. I want to thank Pastor Chris Hull and Allison Hull for being our guests today. It was fantastic. We're going to put um, a little link to your church uh, and and so forth in in our uh, podcast notes. So you guys can check out Pastor Chris Hull um, if you wish. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been fantastic. Thank you all. It was fun times. All right. You ending it there, boob. <laughs>